So here we have our snap-on uh, machine here. And remember, when working on refrigerant, always wear safety apparatus. So we're going to put our safety goggles on. And if you want to pull up the pro demand, let's see yep. what we have to do to get this vehicle prepped. Meanwhile, I'm going to go ahead and uh, let's connect our, our fancy pressure gauge or our snap-on gauges. That, that's a cool. We'll set these to the side for just a moment. All right, there's your pro demand. We're right on there. And while I'm three. pulling these and changing these ends here, I want to point out, guys and gals, you know those little silly little plastic caps that are on the lines, the test ports? They are a primary fitting, a primary seal. If they're missing, you need to replace them. That is very important. A lot of cars come in, Pete, without them. And, you know, makes it that much more difficult. You're going to need the right tool to remove those ends to basically put new fittings on. All right. By the way, uh, that primary seal thing is also true of tire caps. Okay, we have our um, Pierre in the back here reminding us that the same applies to those caps on the valve stems, primary seal. You need to make sure those are there. Keep that valve from getting open a little bit. I know that it's a bad thing when it's an RV trailer. I've had more than one blow out on me because of that. So let's take a look at what our requirements are. See if you could tell oh. me what the... Oh, yeah. So you actually, the, the Camaro, the Chevy gives us three different steps to take. The first one is to help us determine, according to Chevy, if we have enough refrigerant in the system to continue the test. Yep. So right? it has steps one, two, and three here. Park the vehicle inside or in the shade. Well, we're in, we're in air condition here. Open the windows in order to ventilate the interior of the vehicle. Check. Three, a system, AC system was operating. Allow the AC system to equalize for two minutes. Turn ignition off. Install the air condition service, yada, yada. Yeah. Uh, six, record ambient air temperature and humidity. Seven, record low and high side static pressure reading. Are right. both low and high side within specific range. So all right. So I don't know if you can zoom in on those gauges. And I'll see if I can read them with my safety glasses on. I'm looking at about let's see 74 psi on the low side, and right about the same on the high side. And the temperature in here is about 74 about degrees. About 74 degrees. So, Mr. Trulia, if you'd be so kind, it says if we're over 74 degrees, that would be which one of those three? Go to step two. Yeah, so it's say between 75 degrees or so, it should be about 70 PSI. That's what we got. So this is actually telling us so far, step one, we should have enough refrigerant in the system to continue our test. So we passed that. So number two, we're going to do like the performance test. What do we have to do there, Mr. It Julia? says close vehicle doors and windows. All Operate right. Operate the driver window. Select the, uh, the HVAC settings. Set the AC on on. Coldest temperature setting. All right. The maximum blower speed. All right. Recirculation mode. The instrument panel IP outlet mode. All right. So that means panel mode. All IP outlets are open. All right. That's another important step right yeah. there. And what, what I got giggled about was is what it says in there for the driver's side window. It doesn't say open it. It says open it five to six inches. Yep. <laughs> okay. So we're going to go ahead and set that up, and then we're going to run it, and we're going to get some measurements and see what we got from there. I'll put the exhaust fan on so we don't uh, have an issue. I don't want to choke you out or nothing. Well. New car, hard to do. <laughs> While that's going through its setup, take a look at using our thermal imager. I'm going to blow this up. This was the condenser. And right now that it's on, I'm going to show you a new picture that's going to be coming in. I just took the picture here. So 
while well, Jesus is doing that, of course, you want to give time. There you go. Look at the difference oh, at between off and on. You could see heat transfer starting to happen. Go ahead, Pete. I'm sorry. Oh, not at all. And I think that's a great way to visualize what we were talking about of what's going on inside the condenser. And not only is that the physical temperature, but that's heat laden vapor yep. that we have to get rid of and you can actually you should be able to actually watch it as it goes down and get cooler near the bottom but anytime you're doing one of these test course you have to give it a few minutes in order to stabilize right now I'm reading about 43 degrees at the duct Wow. That's roughly a 31 degree difference. What we got and there in the pressure readings there? You're about 32 and about one, probably about 130 or so. All right, so we got 32, 130, and 43. Now we can go back to what Chevy says, see what, we, what they tell us it should be. And we installed the thermometers. Got that. In the left and right center panels, apply the parking brake, place it in park neutral, start the engine, operate the AC system for five minutes, inspect all the components, any unusual noises, record the following information, panel duct, airlet temperatures, low pressure, high pressure. There you go. Okay, very important. So now we have to go check the performance table. Yep. Compare the low and high side pressures and panel outlet temperatures to the AC performance table below. So here we go. If the pressures and temperatures recorded do not fall within the specific range, continue to operate the AC five additional minutes, record pressures and temperatures again, compare low and high side pressures and the panel outlet temperatures to the AC performance table below. Does all the temperature uh, recorded fall within this range? So now you can go yes or no, step four or step five. Right. You have the diagnostic chart that tells us what the pressure is supposed to be? There you go, a little more down. There you go, ambient temperature. We go right to that wherever it's got the 74 degree range at. Right there. And then um, see, it should have our low and high side ranges and temperature. Okay, here's low. 27 to 42. Which we were. High, 132 to 7, 176. Which we were. Center duck, about 48. Okay, which we're, yeah, we're a little, little less than that. Right. A little less than that. But so far, it looks like everything is okay with this system, doesn't it? Well, I want everybody to make sure that you understand now. Again, these new systems contain a lot less refrigerant than before. Uh, I remember way, way back in the day, three, four pounds was not unusual. Now there are many vehicles on the market that use less than a pound. I've actually seen one uh, like 10, 11 ounces, I think was the, the smallest charge I've seen so far. We've done like we did the first step with the 350. We did the um, test results with the pressure gauge and the temperature. We compared them to the factory chart. It's telling us everything's okay, but we have still have a complaint from the customer saying, hey, you used to blow colder. So something may not be right. What do we do the next step? Give me just one second to disconnect and change over here. And again, eye protection, as G pointed out. Especially with minus 22 degrees Fahrenheit, Pete. Absolutely. You don't want this stuff in your eyeball. It'll crack like glass. Well, I'm going to hold this up before I connect it. Now, I'm sure that if, and I mean, thank goodness for Mitchell One and, of course, Snap-on for providing all the equipment today. We would have gotten this from our Snap-on friends had they were make these yet. But we did get permission to highlight these. This is actually uh, something called the Mantooth. It's a Bluetooth pressure transducer and has a connected ability to connect a temperature, a contact thermometer to it. And it works on your phone or any Apple or... or uh, Android device, tablet, whatever. And it's going to allow us to measure pressure, temperature, and some other neat stuff. So let me go ahead and hook that up and we'll show that to you.
Yeah, that's really neat. This is, you know, something that you really want to get involved with because it definitely will help you. And of course, there's always a bunch of great tools to buy, right? But if you want to be more exact on what you're doing, well, what better? All right, so I have these in place, and let me go get my phone, and we'll pull that up. So Pete, while well, Pete's getting his uh, his phone there, he's going to pull up these great readings. And you could do this on any tablet or anything. It doesn't matter. So Now here's generally, if you, if you can see that, this is what the screen or the app looks like. Good. Okay. Now we haven't started anything up yet, so this is going to refresh when we, when we do. But this is what it looks like. And I've got my low side and high side pressures. And look, that these are measured in absolute. Why do I need to know absolute? Because that's one of the coordinates for my enthalpy diagram. Whoop, there we go. Yeah, keep, it, keep it bright. There we go. And it's also going to tell me what the saturation temperature is. Remember the scale that we looked at on the mechanical or the manifold gauge? It's doing it there for me. It's doing all the calculations for me, giving me the superheat and subcool in the chart. All right? So let's go ahead and start the car up and see what we got. Okay, so now the car is going to pop on, and we're going to see Pete's phone light up. Oh, if I can squeeze in here. Question, go ahead. Make sure your mic's on. The question is sealed, special type, same as 134. I think he means the O-rings for hoses and pipes. The yeah, they would be specific for the vehicle. So any O-rings or seals? that need to be lubricated, don't put them in dry, and never reuse any O-rings or seals. Yeah, I'm not 100% sure if the uh, if the difference between 1234 or seals are I think they're probably similar. so. I mean, we've ordered them, even from the dealer, and they seem to be the same. All right, so we're just gonna let this stabilize. I think now you can see the actual pressure readings that we got and how they corresponded to what we just had. Notice the temperature. Just uh, There we go. How's that? So you notice that the temperature like in the evaporator it. is below freezing. And look at that. So right away, what's that going to indicate? Pete went yeah, over this. Did we see this a little sooner, a little not too long ago? That we, we see that it's kind of varying around a little bit. But we're kind of on the high side on that superheat. All right? So that's what we've got so far. We'll set that off to the side. Shut the motor down a little bit. So it's a real good way that maybe you wouldn't condemn, you know, a low charge or a high charge. Now you have a more exact science in doing that. What's nice, and I'm going to show this in picture, you can see even better. I'd rather probably do that better. If I choose, I can go down here and pick, if I can see that, I can choose, um, let me show you there. I can choose this enthalpy button and look what I got there. I got my chart. So we're going to go back up to our big screen here so you can see that a little better. Let's take a look and see what that told us. Yeah, we'll come back over to here for it. And we have a question. All right. Scott, can you use machine gauges instead of your hanging gauges? You can. The pressure gauges are going to be just as accurate. The problem is they likely do not have the temperature coordinates for you. Now, you can pull up a, a pressure chart, temperature chart for the refrigerant sure. and do it. 
and, and make that or get that reading for yourself. But if you want to fill out the charts, you need to know the temperature, not the pressure inside those, uh, the condenser and the evaporator. All right? So here's our guinea pig. We did a baseline earlier. Again, pretty similar initial readings, but look at what this is telling us. The superheat number is way high. Shoot the subcooling, yeah, a little bit on the higher side, but not bad. Let's see if I can get, I don't know if I can zoom in that. Can you zoom in on that a little bit there? And take a closer look at the actual chart. Now again, this is something that this tool did for me. I didn't have to do the, do the graph. Remember we saw earlier, look how far over the superheat is. Remember what we're looking at there? When we have that refrigerant leaving the evaporator, what's going on? It's going on, little liquid droplets, no heat load in it, cold, um, enters into the evaporator, it's going to start taking on the heat load from the hotter air around it. It's going to start to warm up. It's going to reach uh, its condensation point, And that's where it's going to go into its change of state. And that point is where it's going to be able to absorb the greatest heat load from the air in the cabin. Now, if we don't have enough in there, that's going to get done way too soon. And as it continues to pass through the evaporator and being exposed to that hot cabin air, now it's going to increase in physical temperature, and that's what you see here in that high superheat. So when we see that higher than we should, we can suspect that there's not enough refrigerant flow for some reason through the evaporator. Again, there could be other causes. Undercharge was one. Maybe the metering device is not working properly, or maybe the airflow is not correct across the evaporator. Maybe there's some restriction to it. Maybe the evaporator cores are damaged. All of these could be a factor in that. All I know is that that's not quite the way we want it to be. Here's the temperature comparison between what we did earlier, 75.9 degrees outside, 44.2 on the inside. So that's roughly a 31, 32 degree difference. That's pretty darn good. But where is the air being measured? It's being measured out, outside here, outside the car. What am I really wanting to know? Is the air going into the evaporator? How cold is that? And that's going to knock several degrees off of that difference. All right. So, what I want to do now, I suspect I have an undercharged condition. The best way to find out is let's do a recovery and we'll find out how much refrigerant's in the system. And for that, we're going to use this new Snap on Polar Tech. Recovery machine. Get the man teeth out of the way. Yep, and we'll get the hoses right here. Excuse my back. There you go. Now, some of you may already be familiar with the 1234 systems and their additional requirements. If not, though, we are certainly going to discuss that as we go because there is a very specific required procedure when dealing with these systems. Now here we're going to start off. We've got the machine turned on. We've got our gauges hooked up. Pressures are stable. We're going to go through the automatic feature and let the machine do its thing. Now this machine is also certified for hybrid surface. Pete, what's the difference between servicing a hybrid vehicle and a conventional one? Well, there are many hybrid vehicles that are using electric high voltage compressors. And they take a special non-conductive oil. If you get even the smallest amount of contamination with 134A or 1234YF oil into these systems, you could have a, a ground fault that's going to keep the vehicle from even running. And if that happens, you're going to be replacing every component in that system. So if you're going to use the machine, if you don't have a machine that's certified that you can flush it out, 
Make sure there's absolutely nothing from the last vehicle getting into that hybrid. Then you want to stay away from it. Or, I think Mr. Trulia has something he can share with us that will even take that an extra step mm -hmm. in protecting those hybrid vehicles from unwanted contamination. Yeah, you can use a filtering system from AirSep. You know, a lot of the hose flush and stuff is good, but when we're dealing with a compressor that can cost you the last one I replaced, $2,900. Wow. And then, of course, you have your receiver dryer and you have everything else. Special oil. So I would say you don't want an isolation fault that you would describe it. Any isolation fault will really give you an issue of either the AC system shutting down and or the whole vehicle shutting down, which would be pretty damn bad. And we got to remember, every car that's electrified, they're only going to have an electric compressor. You know, there are very few hybrids out there that use a belt. That would be some of your old IMA Hondas and some of the, uh, the older Ford Escapes and that. But most of the new ones are all electric compressors. And they could be AC volt, three-phase AC, or they can actually, with a built-in inverter, switch over to DC voltage. So they can either do either one, and they're very expensive. So it's really good to make sure you have the proper training and the proper equipment. And again, with high voltage, it could be a shocking experience. Maybe the last shocking experience you'll have. Yeah. So we don't mm -hmm. want anyone getting hurt. Maybe a good idea to check it out. I mean, so here you do have that option right there on the machine. You can pop on two. There you go. Right. So we'll just go ahead and select regular gasoline vehicle. And now we're going to indicate vacuum time which in this case is a default of 25 minutes, and then how much charge we want the machine to add. This has a 0 .550 kilogram specification, which is just gonna be 550 grams. So we'll just plug that in. Hit and enter. we found that information in ProDemand as well as Absolutely. the service label. Yep, and, and you wanna make sure, don't go by the service label under the hood. If the vehicle manufacturer has made a change for whatever reason to that specification, you got to look for that TSB that's going to let you know that. And you've heard Gene and I preach numerous times. Part of your service and diagnostic process is to check those TSBs. So make sure you use that as your final determining factor. All right, so we're going to hit enter. This actually allows me to put in a tag number if I want to keep a permit record for that particular vehicle. We'll just bypass that for this right now. Vacuum time is set. Charge is set. We're all set to go. Hit enter. Now the machine will detail exactly what we need to do. It tells us to connect the lines, make sure that they're connected and open. And this part right here is super important to follow the prompt on the screen. And when they say open, it means screwing it down to open the connection. Yeah. Very, very important. So now we're all good, Pete. We can all hit good, the enter. Sir. Now here's an important part. It is going through an automatic refrigerant identification phase. This is a requirement for machines certified for 1234YF. But as you heard G say earlier, this is something you should be doing on every vehicle that comes into your shop before you hook your machine up to it. And before that is the sealant test. Get you a sealant te tester, not that much, and it will help you protect your equipment, which can cost you a whole heck of a lot more and have to fix or replace. So and it's going to go. Ruining a beautiful machine like this, Pete, would be a shame. You know, they don't really. Uh guarantee it for someone not following the rules, yep. right? Okay, we have a question. All right, do you need to add oil when performing an evac and recharge? Does the machine automatically add oil during service? That's a great question, Marty. When you're doing a uh, evac and recharge, you're actually losing very little of any oil, especially in these newer systems. Many of, the oil, many of these systems now the oil is only in the compressor. We're not filling the entire system with it anymore. You know, it used to be that we have a lot of oil that would make its way to the evaporator, to the condenser, 
being carried along by the refrigerant, but the goal now is to keep it in the compressor and away from the rest of the system. Uh, if we're going to add any, uh, not unless I'm making a component replacement or if I see something collecting in my recovery and the machine, as you will see, is going to tell us exactly that. And you can see here we have 100% 1234YF, nothing else in there, and it had zero air. Zero air, very important. So now, after that, it's going to take the refrigerant in. But one thing I do want you to be aware of, on the drain bottle, you should always make sure you look at the machine. And you can see down here, the bottle has nothing in it. I usually, rather than remember where it's at, I take a piece of painter's tape. Since this has nothing in it, we're not going to worry. But let's say I had some in it. I would put paint this tape, let's say right on this mark right here. That way I could see how much I took out. Generally, very little comes out. So that's something that you want to do. Also, on maintenance on your machine, you should have a spare filter around, even though it's a new machine. You need oil and filter because all these machines will warn you, and then you know what will happen? It will shut the machine down. Super important. So please keep that in mind, that that is something that could be an issue. So here, you can see we're recovering. It's going to tell us the amount. We're going to be able to print some paperwork out that comes right out of the machine here. We had a bunch before, just to give you an idea. And these are very important, in my opinion, to give to the customer what we do on our machine we do we take that we make a picture out of it because a lot of times thermal paper will start to wear out or maybe the paper will get lost so why not put it in the system so you can see our gauges are going down and as i said before it's a very expensive refrigerant you definitely don't want to have any leaks. We've been doing 1234 for quite a few years, and a lot of body shops bring us vehicles that they've replaced some parts on. Now that being said, you know, before we started using something I'm gonna show you, there was a bunch of problems with the body shops, Pete. They would say, well, I paid you for the refrigerant and it leaked out. You just told us to refill it, and there was nothing in it when we got it. We evacuated it, okay? We did, you know, a long period of time, 35, 40 minutes. These new machines, the spec is if they can pump down to a certain amount, it may be 5 to 15 minutes. But it's good practice to do at least 25 minutes, okay? I like to do 35 or 45 that way water boils at 59 degrees Fahrenheit and any moisture in there, you could boil that out and hopefully make the system that much better. Yep, absolutely. Yes. Oh, question. Well, he, he had it on the wrong spot, but um, the, uh, there's a question about using nitrogen for leak testing. Okay, so I, I knew someone was going to bring nitrogen up. Well, this is not your father's yeah. Oldsmobile anymore, or Saturn, okay, I like saying this, or Pontiac. There were a lot of business. Your butt will be out of business. Now, nitrogen is good, but do you have a nitrogen test? No. So we're going to show you a better way to do it, because these leaks are so small, the smaller molecule is CO2, chemical-wise, okay? So if you put that in and you have a gas analyzer, you could find the leak. And guess what we're going to show you? A gas analyzer. Okay. So I could take my gas analyzer right here, a CO2 bottle down below. Probably tough to see with this in the way. Let me move this out of the way. So we won't need that anymore. And I could hook this up with a special hose with all the refrigerant removed, Pete. Don't mix CO2 with the refrigerant. This is after you recover it. 
put it in a vacuum for a little bit. We put 200 pounds of CO2 in, we take our gas analyzer here with a little hose, and we search the area for a leak. If you graph it and it comes up, you'll know what type of problem you have. Now you would say, well, why not just do it with the 2913 leak detector? Well, that's mandatory, Pete, but I'm gonna tell you the real deal, not that easy to find. So this is another new tool out by Snap-on. You can check this out, the Snap-on gas analyzer. I made this hose up myself. You usually have a big 20-foot hose. It takes a little too long to actually suck it through to see what CO2 is. So we won't do that. So come on, we're professionals. You need the right equipment. And we're going to show you this 2913 in a sec. Well, actually, you should show it here now. Yeah. Put it on the highest sensitivity. Yeah, it was, and it's interesting because it, when you talk about soap bubbles, that was okay in the R12 days when you had, again, like four pounds of refrigerant in there. We used to use the halon thing to look for the flame jet. Right, right. And now we're looking at, like you said on your screen, three grams a year leakage rate. That's nothing. That's 0.1 ounce a, over, the, over the course of a year. Good so we're looking for then. very small leaks here. Um, okay, so this is the, uh, the new... J2913 snap-on leak detector they were kind enough to send to us. We're going to show you how it's used as part of the uh, recharge and evacuate process. But it's got some nice features to it. We're going to let it warm up here and then I can share those with you. Yeah, so as that's warming up, because it does have some neat stuff there, I'll continue on with a couple of things here. So we talked about $70 a pound. Use CO2. Okay, you can buy that big bottle that we showed you there before. You could buy the bottle in a gauge set, probably under two, three hundred bucks, and refilling it. It's very inexpensive, about twenty nine dollars to fill that bottle up. Okay. Uh, all our twelve uh, thirty four YF machines perform leak checks. One, a vacuum leak check. You may want to write this down. It's mandatory ten minutes. You're not going to skip it. Oh, I'll just blow by it. You can't blow by it, right, Pete? Can't do it. And a pressure leak test. Now, pressure leak test, we know when the system's off, the pressure is higher on the low side, isn't it? This is why you can get away with what I'm going to tell you in a second here. This procedure is mandatory since it's checks for flammable refrigerant being released into the vehicle's interior. We went over the liability. You don't just buy the machine. All the snap-on dealers should also be selling you this 2913 leak detector. Okay, without this, your liability is enormous. Vanna White here. Vanna White thing. To my side. Now, the R1234YF charge during the leak check is only 15%. You say, why? I'm going to tell you why, Pete. They don't want you blowing big money when this thing has a huge leak that you didn't find. The leak may not even be there. Can you see why you want to put 200 pounds of CO2? after you recovered the refrigerant, after you basically evacuated just a small period of time. You shut it off, you put the CO2 in it, then you say, well, what do I do with the CO2? Do I leave it in there? Absolutely not. You gotta let it out very slowly. You put a rag, you open the valve a little bit, opening means turning clockwise. You make sure you don't get a puddle of oil if you open it full, you may blow oil out. Usually, we have not seen any oil come out on all the cars we did on 1234 YF. So we do it slowly, we don't have a problem. So after that total charge is there, it forces you to check for a leak in the evaporator after the panel duct is selected to the floor panel, fan on low speed, no AC on, fan on low speed, use the 2913 leak detector, highest sensitivity, and you should leave it in there. We're not gonna do this today. We're gonna to show you in there, but you should leave it in there about five minutes. If no leak is detected in five minutes, supposedly it's good. Yeah, update, we are still about nine minutes into our vacuum down period, so we'll okay. continue along here. We want to say a little bit, sure, like I said, we weren't talking about this, this leak detector. I don't know if you can see the screen there, okay. Yeah, she probably can come in on it. Oh, yeah, I mean, yeah. this is this is pretty cool. 
I mean, first I could turn the, the audible alarms off or on with the little push of the button. I can set the sensitivity using the little button here, high. We're going to leave it on high for a later test. And here's something I thought was pretty cool about this one. Check this out. This thing has a graphing display on it. So if you're looking for that, if you're looking for that really small leak, there you go. You can actually watch that graph, and when you start getting closer, you'll see it increase, and it'll start to decrease when you pass it. So, so Can that's that a graph? nice, that's a nice little feature. That's really nice. Visuals are All great. Right. And of course, great setup. Of course, on the end, we've got uh, the UV bulbs to help look for that light, that uh, dye detection. But let's and, uh, talk. Regular. I'm not quite sure where we are. Oh, we are in the leak check phase. Ah, leak okay, check. Okay, so the machine two. has gone through its vacuum uh, pull down, and then it has gone through, and now it's doing its second test. It what it's doing now is it's doing a vacuum decay test. So we've got two five-minute total, ten-minute tests running. It has to be pulled down to a certain vacuum level before it will go into this test. If it can't do that. It's going to stop you right there saying there's a leak. I'm not charging nothing until you fix the leak. And this is helping you save money. Because, again, like you said, $70 a pound, that's a lot of money. Sniffer that meets that 2913 standard, we're going to make sure we have it on high. And then we need to place it in the car. I can get it. We can turn the fan and turn the fan on low, and we're going to let it run there. So if we want to, if you actually want to, you actually want to show that one, just put it in there. I'm going to show. Okay. He's going to put the key on, air condition off, and you can see follow up the black. You see what a throttle pedal is? He has it right up there. The GM's got to hold the button in. Well, he has to move it. He only has Let me get my. And I ain't jumping off. Let me get my old butt out there the way so you can see. Okay, so a fan should be on low inside the vehicle. Okay. Yeah. Now this would be what refrigerant it. We're kind of jumping the stuff. We didn't put anything yeah, in Yeah, the machine is just about set to go ahead and add that charge back. I think I heard it just now. Yeah, I heard a click. It's only going to add about 10 15%, I believe, of the total charge quantity. 15% by law. Um, and that's going to require us to do what we're doing here. We should have the door closed. Again, close up the vehicle. Fans on low, uh, ducks to the floor, and we're going to let it sit here for like three minutes, or five minutes rather, at least, to give a chance for it to pick up anything. Now, we're not going to you know, wait that whole time now, so we'll show you the next steps on the, on the tool. You can see with AC blower motor on low, AC is switched off, mode is set to floor, move to the next step. Place a 2913 compliant leak detector, set to maximum sensitivity, that's four grams a year, which is nothing, into the center of the floor uh, duct outlet as far as possible. So that's what we have back there. Now, after it's been sitting for five minutes, we go to the next step, and it's gonna ask us, was this test performed? Be honest. <laughs> don't, don't, again, I can't stress this enough. This is a mildly flammable refrigerant, true. But if you set a vehicle out and get past this point to charge it, and it's got a leak in the evaporator case, who do you think they're gonna come looking at if something happens? They're gonna come see you, because your shop and your name are the, on that repair order, so. And remember, someone like Mercedes-Benz, they thought it was so bad, they haven't put it in their car, and they're basically paying a fine. Yeah. Mm. They're still using 134A. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So, was this leak found? Or was a leak found? No. Is there an auxiliary evaporator? That's another great point. Don't forget, if you're, a lot of these SUVs have the evaporator core in the rear as well. So, we need to check that one the same way we're checking the front one. In this case, we don't have one, so we'll hit no. And now it's going to go ahead and proceed with the charge. Behind you. Okay, so now you can see it's going in.
See our pressures going up. And it goes in pretty rapidly. But how much are we putting in? Well, originally you only had the 15% of the charge, right? And now, now that we stated that there was no leak, the rest of the charge will go in. In this case, 0 0.550 kilograms, verified by checking in our service information, pro demand. Now, you know, the other thing that I found on a lot of new cars, I've done on a few of my own new cars and other cars that I've done for municipalities, I found that it's about two to four tenths of a pound low on all new vehicles. Yeah. It seems like the OEs want to save a little money. Yeah. Well, we got surprised with this one. Yeah. Maybe that was the exception, though. And yeah. we'll find out. So, so here, this is an important step right yeah, yeah. here. So when you look at this, you got to read the directions. It tells us, take off the red, unscrew it, right? It says, disconnect the high pressure coupling, start the AC system with the low coupling connected. What do you think it's doing? You're going to suck the hoses out. Yep. Now, sometimes 96 inch hoses may have a couple of ounces of refrigerant in them. Right. Hose. And if we want an accurate charge, you got to account do for that. Our older machines didn't make us do that. And to point out to what you said earlier about leaving your machine under pressure, if you hook that up to the vehicle and there's a refrigerant pressure higher in those hoses than it is in the vehicle, well, you just, you're counting that in terms of your recovery, and that's going to throw your, your numbers off. So we're going to start the vehicle up. I'm going to put the fan on. So we're going to hit enter. Gauge went right up. Let me know when it's all done. Okay, now it's going to tell me what to do here. It says disconnect the low pressure coupler, so I'm going to follow directions and do that. I'm going to put the service caps back on, a very important step to do. And boy, I can feel this is a cold system. You can leave that key on. You can leave that key on so we can do scan data. All right. And now you see the machine? It is actually pumping it down and recovering anything that's left in there and leaving the machine in a vacuum. If you ever come back to see that your machine is not in a vacuum, you may have a problem with a hose getting loose. Okay, so we're going to hit print and we get a report which is kind of nice so you can see we have 100% purity test the vacuum was 25 minutes the uh, gas recovered I think that says 55 okay and the charge was 550 355 yeah, 355 so that was grossly undercharged now I already have the results Again, of a similar uh, similar charge recharge, um, where we had that undercharge identified and, and recharged it with the proper amount. We redid the test, so let's kind of look at the last couple of slides we've got here on that, and I'll share those results with you because I want to see want you to see what the difference it made. Okay, now we have the correct charge installed. You see, our pressures are not all that much different, but look at the difference in the superheat and subcool levels much much different all in the green and looking much much better and this is nice because it even gives us the diagram excuse me it even gives us the diagram and it'll show and I'll show you in a moment the difference between those two remember we talked a bit about the scale and the gauges I just want to show this to you to, to point that out we measured 47.8 PSI, but that was absolute using the Bluetooth pressure transducers. So we'd have to deduct 
the barometric pressure in our area to get the PSI we'd see on our gauge. So let's just say roughly 14 PSI. That would bring us down to about 33, 34. Again, match it up to the gauge, and we see that the temperature gauge reading, 33, 34 degrees, lines up with our saturation temperature that is being calculated by this, this tool. Very nice feature. Again, there's a little close-up of the new enthalpy chart with the correct charge installed. And look at the difference on the right side as compared to what we started off with. Again, not preaching that the enthalpy chart is the, is the only best all way to do it. It's another tool in the toolbox uh, and can just help you uh, do a lot of things. Like I said, again, if you're just doing this as a quick test of your customer's system to make sure they don't have a problem. Using the anemometer that can be used across all vehicles or vehicle specific. Love this tool. That anything I, under 10 miles an hour, okay, you know, and of course the standard cubic feet per minute, I think is a thousand is normal. Anything under it is bad. I go by miles an hour. Anything under 10 kind of sticks in my head as a problem. Usually my new truck is like over 18 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. So this is a quick little check. You just put this doohickey right in here. And you put this puppy on. I put the button on. Yeah, this, by the way, could be a huge money maker if I can get the right thing in the right hole. Okay, and there we go. So you put this on. It tells you the temperature in here is actually 73 degrees, and my air conditioned system is only oh, it's blowing at 18 miles plus an hour. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty good. No wonder why we're cold. <laughs> I'd rather be cold than hot. So this is a little thing that's really pretty neat. All right. Get well, it. we want to kind of start bringing things to a wrap up, but we were asked to take a look at some scan tool data. So we're going to do that real quick. Just give you an idea. Um, if Did you're paying for your scan tool. And while G's setting that up, of course, the very, very first thing I would ever want to do when I hook up my scan tool, especially if I'm going in enhanced mode, is I want to do a full system scan. Remember what we found on the Audi with the code set for the research door? A few other communications issues. I'm going to do a full scan. Not necessarily because it might leave me just the air conditioning you know, problem, but it will help me make sure that there are anything or is there anything else going on my customer needs to know about. And I can yep. advise them accordingly. So we'll and, go ahead. And, and here we go. Code scan. Now that's a good point. You guys already saw that, that pre-post scan. Just a quick comment on that. If you're not familiar with it, that's more a collision requirement than it is for us because the insurance company, when a car comes in all beat up and wrecked and you can do a, a scan on it before your repair to find out what for sure is wrong uh, and what might be hiding that you didn't know about. And then the post scan is to make sure that you fixed it all and you don't send it back to the customer with something, another new problem or something you forgot because the insurance company doesn't want you to come back and dip into their pockets again. So that's really the reason we do that. But it's not a bad idea when you think about it to do it here in your shop. Yeah. Do it every car your customer comes in. So Keep it with as, them. As we're going through this, there's 10 codes on brakes. I think that's because Pete drives like a madman, but that's a whole other story, right? <laughs> we would want to look, you know, for HVAC codes. We have nothing. Okay. And, of course, we save all these and print them out to the customer. You can email them. So, and here's one of the good things here, as far as the engine side, we got all our monitors ready, very important, so a code would pop up. Now, let's go into the HVAC system real quick. Here's HVAC. Let's look if there's any codes. We already know there are no codes, and hopefully they could see this good. Yeah, it's pretty good. Yeah, it looks pretty here's good. Here's sensor data. So here you have ambient air temperature, 73 degrees. There was our temperature out of the duct, and you guys all know, you know, you could graph stuff, which is great. High side pressure. Yeah, but this, this is a good place to go when you're, when you're doing your review to look for any of these PIDs that just stand out as being out of whack. Like if you're looking at a lot of these temperature sensors and the vehicle's been sitting in the shop and it's had a chance to, to, to uh, acclimate, 
that all these temperature sensors should read pretty close to one another. And look at this. Passenger compartment humidity sensor. GM has been using humidity sensors even in their mass airflow sensor like on the car here, an eight wire sensor. They, they're looking at windshield temperature and inside temperature. Pretty neat, right? Pretty neat. So there's some good stuff there. Let's see some other data. So battery voltage is always something you want to see. Blower speed, ignition, rear defroster status, indicator. So is it seeing the request? Now there's another thing right here. Very important, AC request. Well, you may have the button pressed, but if the computer don't see it, it ain't going on, right? right. It's not gonna go on. And when you're dealing with these uh, climate uh, uh, control, uh, automatic climate control systems, um, you want to know that the inputs the driver's putting in are being are seen by the control module, and you just check your data PIDs, up, up, um, hit those buttons, and look for the state on the PID list to change. And right here, you got your recirc recirculation door counts. You can do that. You probably can get into bi-directional test here. So yeah, just save that screen. And here, AC permission data. Now this is important because if the clutch is inhibited, all right, if you have anything here that is gonna prevent it from going on, it's gonna be right up there in data. So it would be a very good idea if you go in there. Face, face, face plate data. <laughs> How to get that out of the mouth, right? So we can tell you here if the button's on, if something's active, not active. Real yeah. important information. Let's show them that, bud. Yeah, yeah. Let me hit Let's, some buttons and see if we can see the change of states. Yeah, you be the button man. All right, first one. Yeah. There you go, active, inactive. AC switch, do that again. I'll, I'll graph it here. And you can see, you see that going on and off? Okay, that is the way to go. All right. We have a question here while your taxes are turned around, but I asked it anyway. Uh, can you give us the name of the diagnostic uh, tool and the software? This is the Snap on Zeus that we're looking at, and it's the latest software version that they have out. Um, uh, this is 2021, uh, first quarter, I guess. Yeah. Now, and security to, and to be code. Honest, I got to give them props because usually you don't see something coming out. I mean, a 2020 model car and having access to this kind of data, you know, while technically it's still under factory warranty. And, right. And look at all this stuff security yeah. code accepted, security lockout, security program encounter, a lot of stuff. And, and thinking about program information, if you don't have a J2534 and you don't have a NASTEF license, you should go to nastf.org and take a look at that. Yep. And module information, very important here. This would be mode nine, because here is the vehicle identification number. And if this is wrong, this could be a major issue. Okay. You could see if there's any update. You could check that against the GM website. And if you had to program something, you could. So all yep. important information and Snap-on seem to have done a very good job here on this particular car. Yeah. Now, I'm not 100% sure. I don't think it did allow bi-directional control. This car, like I said, is equipped with the, the internal heat exchanger. It's also equipped with a variable compressor. Uh, if you're not familiar with that, guys and gals, the variable compressor allows the computer to um, change the, uh, the displacement of the compressor to minimize the drain on the rest of the engine. In other words, let's have just enough refrigerant circulating through the system to meet the demands at the time. And the computer's in charge of that. Now typically when we go into our test mode and we have it set at low, max, cool, it's going to default to that 100% displacement so we can get our pressure readings. But if you're taking a test and you have the control set in automatic mode, it's at a temperature that's very close to the temperature of the cabin, you may see your pressures drastically different. In fact, they may be very close to one another because there's very little compression 
being produced by that variable compressor. If you don't have the ability to bidirectional control in your scan tool, there are tools available from a number of manufacturers that will allow you to actually disconnect the compressor, plug in with the tool, and then manually adjust the displacement yourself so that you can properly test the compressor. Now, what we have here is a couple of surface relearns, re replace and relearn uh, HVAC actu actuator, replace and reset ambient air temperature sensor, and replace and re replace a blower motor. So you use relearns that you are not aware of, just like changing an oxygen sensor, yep. there's a relearn. Now, they did not have in here yet, and it's a new car, in all fairness to them, there is no bi-directional in HVAC. Now, maybe in the body module. Let me go in here just for the hell of it. No, I saw something on testing the variable compressor in there um, earlier, but I don't know if it was a bi-directional or just uh, graphing the operation while you manipulated it. I didn't see it. These are the only two here, yeah. but... No, they were, was, yeah, one of those two, but... Anyway, like I said, I'm not sure it was, it was at, uh, out there. So I guess that should take care of. So thank you all. Have a great evening. And don't forget, we'll see you again in August. That's right. We'll Stay be back. Tuned. We'll be back. The boys are back in town. Thank you. Have a good night. All right.